my name is Dr. James Galloway. Welcome to this MRCP revision lecture looking at exam technique. So I'm, I'm hoping you're watching this lecture at the beginning of your revision. If it's the night before, I'll probably switch it off now because I'm not going to offer anything valuable with one day to go. But I, I think exam techniques are a very important part to focus on. Obviously, you're going to need core knowledge to pass this exam. But I think if your core knowledge gets you to 60% in the exam, exam technique could get you to 70% because a, a lot of people fall down on their approach to answering the questions. That's what I'm going to talk about today. Um, but before I do, just an introduction to the exams in general. Should, you'll have all been familiar with the exam fees website. Um, £391 for UK applicants for part one. £391 for part two, which is a bargain, I'll tell you why in a minute. And uh, substantially more, as you can see, for, for PACES. The exams are, are formatted as follows. Part one um, is two papers, both of them are three hours long. And it's made up of MCQs. There's 100 MCQs in each paper. And each of these have a best of five structure. And by best of five, this means that there will be a, a, a STEM, which will describe a clinical scenario or set a, a clinical question. And then you'll have to choose from, from five answers, A through E. The answers are put in an alphabetical order so that there's no, uh, you can't guess if it's been A, 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 it means it's going to be a different answer for the next one. It's, it's alphabetical in terms of what the answers are. And they are designed that all five answers are potentially good answers. There's discouragement now from putting in answers that are, com com that are obviously wrong. And often th there should be just a couple that you come down where you really should be debating which is the best answer. And that's how they, they create discriminating questions. The syllabus for this is published online. And, and I, I'm afraid, I, I think the syllabus that's published currently is quite challenging to work through because it, it combines all of the, the components you need for your foundation and speciality training, or your speciality training in medicine, um, into your core learning objectives, some of which are part one, part two, some of which are clinically, the clinical exam, and, and it makes it quite challenging to tease apart. The older syllabus, I have to say, was probably slightly easier to work out what you had to approach. But these are the subjects, and, and this gives you an idea of the weighting of each subject. And you'll see pharmacology, toxicology taking 20, 20 marks there. Although that may seem like a lot, but a lot of that is you're able to relate to that within the, the setting of a specialty. For example, uh, knowing about warfarin interactions would definitely be pharmacology, but a lot of you'll be familiar with that from your cardiology on the wards. Toxicology. Again, you'll all be familiar with paracetamol overdoses. And, and so a lot of these are uh, applicable to the other specialties. You'll see that some of the specialties like rheumatology have 15 points. And, and a lot of you won't have done rheumatology in part of your, your um, SH, part of your foundation or, or speciality training, because it's one of the smaller specialties, and yet carries an equivalent rate to cardiology. And that's important to be aware of. And of course, there's the, the smaller specialties that you must remember. Ophthalmology carrying four marks, although a relatively small amount of, of learning into ophthalmology can pick up those four marks. And the clinical sciences, which can look the most daunting, because these are the things that you may not have done since your first year at medical school, cell biology, physiology. But you can gain some comfort in the fact that each of the individual clinical sciences carry relatively small weights. Only two questions per, per exam on the cell biology, for example, which will be a reassurance to some of you. Statistics, I'd highlight at the end there, actually carries quite a substantial weight within the clinical sciences, carrying five of those clinical science points. And that's important to be aware of. And I think getting to, to grips with some of the, the key com concepts and statistics is going to be key. Part two is the same style. It's papers that are based on MCQs, but this time you get three papers, each three hours long. So it's split over two days. That's why it's a bargain for the, for the price. You get three papers for the price of two. Uh, you may find that funny after you've done the exam. But <laughs> so the, the, the part two paper was traditionally slightly different in that they used to combine both best of five questions with also end from many questions. So you would have, um, you'd have to pick often two possible answers, two correct answers from, from many. The, the college has actually stopped using those by the looks of things. The last few exams they've not had any in and, and um, current publications in the college have, have stopped saying that they're included. You'll see some of them included in some of the past test lectures, and I think they can be useful for learning. Um, but I, I think you should see both of these exams as being predominantly best of five exams. 
The syllabus for part two narrows down. And if you imagine the part one exam is asking you um, what a condition is about, part two is going into what is it about and what do you do about it. So it's going into a more clinically orientated approach. And, and I think it's more than just knowing about the, the basic mechanisms, but into understanding how you might treat someone or how you've, you formulate a differ differential diagnosis in any given setting. And so it's the more applied. And, and once you can demonstrate what you know about the diagnosis and how you treat it, the pace is then supposed to be showing someone you can do this in the Viva type setting where you have a, a real patient. So what are the tips I can offer you for, for passing this exam? Well, I, I've chosen three tips. I, I think, and these are very simple. I think the things I'd recommend is firstly, use a timetable. Secondly, do practice questions. Can't say that enough times. And thirdly, use people. And I'll explain what I mean by these. With regards to the timetable, and I'm sure there'll be people watching this and say, oh, I don't use a timetable for exam. But the reason I think this is a good idea, firstly, there's no doubt that putting in the hours is, is key to passing this exam because the number of hours you put into learning the core knowledge um, is, is going to mean how much core knowledge you're going to retain. So putting in the hours to pass this exam, and I, I think you're, you're looking at, ideally, you've got six, eight weeks at a minimum, ideally nearer three months to prepare for this exam with a regular three, four nights a week putting in one to two hours on each of those nights. And, and so it's a lot of commitment to, to do well in this exam. But in addition to that, you have to remember that there's a large breadth of knowledge to cover here. And, and the, the breadth of knowledge and, and the wide selection of specialties you have to cover, particularly when you're at part one level where you've had less clinical experience, means that it can be challenging to incorporate all those specialties into your, your revision. If, for example, you're sure you want to be a cardiologist, there's undoubtedly a temptation to dwell on the cardiology subjects, learn all about the, the cardiology side of the different specialties, and miss the, the, some of the bigger picture of the other specialties. And that's why a timetable can be useful, because it allows you not only to make sure you're doing the hours, but it allows you to make sure you're covering the breadth, breadth of subjects. Past questions. And I think this is a key part of your revision here. And, and I would encourage you to avoid the large textbooks. This isn't the time to be going back to Harrison's to start reading the beginning of a chapter on whatever your, your specialty you're revising is. But, but it's the time to, to use questions, use sample questions. And whether this is going to a website or, or using books of questions, um, I, I think it doesn't necessarily matter as long as you're getting the questions in. Obviously, I, I'm presenting on behalf of PASTEST. So I recommend the PASTEST facilities. You can go to the PASTEST website, www. You're probably already there, I hope, if you're watching this lecture. I maybe don't need to give you that. But rather than saying which one you need, I think the key is to concentrate on past questions. Because it's about trying to get a feel for what the college is asking in these questions. About thinking about when they write the question, what piece of information are they looking for? And getting your mind into that, that set of, of understanding the MRCP knowledge in the setting of questions is different to just understanding the core knowledge. And look for patterns, because that is a huge part of what this exam is about. It's about pattern recognition of clinical disease. That's what practicing medicine is about in large part. So let me give you a sample question. This is a 61-year-old Indian, Indi ah, OK. I'm thinking tuberculosis. He's an Indian male smoker. Hmm, 61 smoker. No, I'm going to go with lung cancer who presents with confusion and fever. Hmm, I'm not sure that's maybe smoker, maybe he's got lung cancer and Mets. Oh, hold on, his boyfriend tells you he's been having headaches. So they're giving you a risk factor for HIV here. Oh, this is gonna be cryptococcal meningitis maybe? For the last two weeks, that would fit. Could still be TB, although the period is short, time period is a bit short for TB. Oh, I'm not sure. What else do they tell us? He recalls that, ah, he was bitten by a dog on his last visit to India eight weeks ago. Ah, that scuppers everything. Th this sounds like rabies. Bitten by a dog, presenting with headache, con confusion, fever. This is encephalitis. Sounds like rabies. What's the question, they ask? Which one of the following tests would be, most would be the most appropriate initial investigation? What have they given us? LP with India ink staining. So India ink staining, nothing to do with him being from India. The stain for cryptococcal infection. Okay, I like that. Nuchal biopsy with H and E stain from nebri bodies. I saw that on a house. That's what you do to test for, for, um, uh, for rabies. 
Good thought. I like that because that's quite out there. HIV test. Uh, everyone gets an HIV test. Ah, maybe I'm going to go with the HIV test. Chest radiograph. That's the whole TB thing. And perhaps, you know, perhaps that's go with the simplest thing. And actually, yeah, E. Go with the simplest thing. Blood glucose. Because actually, that's the correct answer. Because he's confused. And sure, you might do all the rest of them. But in a confused patient, the first thing you're going to do is check a blood glucose. What's the best initial investigation? That's what they've asked you. If they'd said, what's the, going to be the most diagnostic, quest, diagnostic investigation, that changes it completely. And, and to be honest, I'm not sure you could give, a, give an answer there. But that's, that's the sort of thing I mean about by practicing questions. Because reading the question is so key to being able to, to understand what the college are getting at. Partly, they're going to be putting questions out there to see if you can read the question and, and pick up the obvious, the, the ABCs of, of medicine. Do, are you going to be safe and spot the patient on a liver, liver unit who drops his GCS and low platelet count? You still do a blood glucose. Versus the other ones which are going to pick up some of the more esoteric uh, diagnostic findings, like, for example, you need to do India ink staining to find yeasts on a, a CSF stain if you're looking for cryptococcal meningitis. Or that if you, uh, if you have someone who presents with a potential opportunistic infection, you should consider HIV testing. So you need to read the question to, to be able to put your knowledge into context. And there's some clues in the question. Clues in terms of patterns, some clues in terms of the wording as well. Like, for example, never. That's a frightening word in medicine because it very rarely is never true. It's occasionally true. And for the college, there's a few nevers. Plural effusions don't occur in sarcoidosis for the MRCP. And it, in, in fact, even in real life, you'd be hard pushed to explain a plural effusion with sarcoid. Makes you think you've misdiagnosed, actually, it was TB all along. Some things in medicine are characteristic, like a butterfly rash in lupus. It's a very characteristic finding. Contrast that with the word recognised. What do I mean by recognised? Hemolytic anemia in Wilson's disease. Wilson's disease, that's that copper accumulation, hepatolenticular degeneration. Do you get hemolytic anemia in that one? It's not whether it's characteristics, is it's recognised. And it is, it's a recognised presenting complaint in people with Wilson's disease. They can present with a, a hemolytic picture. And so recognised is looking at not necessarily common findings, but rarer, but, but known occurrences of a particular, known presentations of a particular disease. And beware the classic traps. Strep bovis and, and bowel malignancy. So the patient presents with blood cultures positive for strep bovis, and you think, oh, endocarditis, association with bowel malignancy. And you say, what investigation do you want to do? Well, let's go with the colonoscopy. And, and to be fair, that's demonstrating you, you have the knowledge there. But the college likes to see that you can read the question. Because actually, what it may be asking is that what you need to do is diagnose endocarditis. Strep bovis can occur in people without endocarditis. So the first test you're probably going to do is some form of echocardiography. And because even the medical student will know the associations with strep bovis and bowel malignancy. And for membership, you need to take it a step beyond that and just really think about the steps you, you're going to take in managing a patient. If they've not yet had their echo, then the echo is probably the next investigation. Surprisingly, if you look at candidates that come on courses, that's a very common one that's, that's uh, misinterpreted that, that connection with strep bovis and bowel malignancy. And, and it's one of a number of examples of classic traps the college use to try and differentiate those people who can pay attention and read the question all the way from start to finish and not just jump at the what looks like the obvious answer. The third thing I recommended was people. And, and this is just saying that actually the, the best way you can work is, is to use the, the the people you, the best way you can learn is to use the, the patients and people you, you've got to work with at, at your hospital. Because if you, if you try and translate your membership into cases that you actually see in clinical practice, it sticks so much better. Many of you will be familiar with this idea of problem-based learning. If you have to go and look at something and, and solve the answer yourself, it sticks so much better. Next time you're on the wards and you're looking after a patient with a given condition, use that as an opportunity to read it up. Get your seniors to, to teach you, and, and it may be that you get some seniors to do some specific MRCP teaching, but actually, very often, RCP teach-ins are available around the country. Going to local pathology meetings is a great way to try and pick up hints about pathological findings that often come up in membership. Going to grand rounds, and, and people present a case and discuss that case. And these are the, the things that you need to see as, although they don't initially get labelled as MRCP teaching, they are perfect places to learn about MRCP. 
working in groups is useful, and I think it's important to try and gauge where you are in comparison to your colleagues, because I think you can, you can sit and study these questions in isolation and think you're doing really well, but when you start comparing yourself with your, your, your friends and colleagues, you suddenly find that you have to readjust your position. And that's a really useful thing, finding someone, a colleague that you can prepare with. And of course courses, and, and I think it, some people find they work very well on their own or with colleagues, other people find that they do very well in, in a lecture-based scenario, and I think you need to see what works for, works for you. And then on the day. So remember, on the day, you, I don't know what you'll have done the night, the night before, hopefully relaxed. I always used to take the, the approach that I would just pick one subject to read, and I'd pick it at random. If I had a painful joint, I'd read up joint problems or, or whatever. If I had a headache, I'd read up headaches, and, and just read up that one condition the night before and hope it comes up. Um, and, um, and then you, you prepare yourself on the day, part one for your one day's exam, part two for your two days' worth of exams. Remember, you've got to answer every question because there's no negative mark in these. So if you don't answer a question, you lose the point. If you mark it and you get it wrong, you lose nothing. So you must answer every question. And remember, you're not competing with anyone else in the room. The exams are now criterion referenced, which means that the exams are marked to a set standard, a, a pass mark, which is decided before the exam. So that it doesn't matter how many people take the exam, they're not going to say only 30% will pass. That, that doesn't happen anymore. The pass mark is predetermined so that you are competing with the same level that the people that sat the exam on the last sitting and those who will sit on the next sitting ha had to compete with. And, of course, does it take you three hours to do 100 questions? I, I think most people usually find that you do finish a bit early and you you've got some time at the end and, and what should you do? And I I'm not sure there's a, a right answer. Although, I think people often have a tendency to go back to those really difficult questions and think, ah, that, that question about, was it TTP or... Let's just see if I can work through on that. And I'd encourage you to do something slightly different, which is to go through the questions that were really easy. Because certainly my own experience is when I sit past questions, and I occasionally do that still for my enjoyment, the, the ones I get wrong are the really obvious ones. I, I go back and look through and think, I've misread the question. And those are the ones that are the easiest points to pick up again. So just read the question and think, ah, I completely missed that. I saw someone mention Connecticut and I went for Lyme disease and it was complete red herring and they wanted me to do a blood glucose. But I think you need to see what, whatever you want to do at the end. I, I think the key thing is, is hours spent before the exam to prepare, putting the hours in, covering the breadth of subjects and doing that using past questions. So, good luck and uh, enjoy the lectures. Mm -hmm.